All right, good morning, everybody. It's a Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock, and that means another episode of WEBS Webinar Wednesday. Um, my name is Thijs van Rosmalen. I'm working at WEBS as an account executive, and every Wednesday morning, I host a webinar together with an interesting keynote speaker talking a marketing, sales, or customer success topic and today i'm very happy that bas wouter will join us we will going to talk about the online influence in b2b um, if you are joining in uh, for the first time let me explain some easy rules for this webinar to make sure that you take the full value of this hour um, as you noticed you're all on mute so please make yourself known in the chat pane and um, if you have a question doesn't matter where in the presentation, just use the chat that will be your biggest friend this morning. And I will manage the chat and I have permission of boss to interrupt him at certain times to make sure we answer all your questions. Okay, by saying those simply rules, I, may, I hope you will be active and make sure that you ask all your questions so we make, uh, um, yeah, we can answer them for you. Um, if you feel comfortable enough, uh, uh, feel free to put on your webcam as well so we know who are we talking with and um, don't need to write all the things Boss is telling um, uh, uh, because uh, you can make your notes, but we also share some stuff after this webinar in order to get you up and running with this great, great topic. Um, and this topic is about online influence. We all know in B2C, the famous example, you uh, uh, go search for a hotel room, of ex for example, uh, at booking.com. Those principles, we, we may know them from uh, uh, Professor Chialdini, uh, are seducing us to book the room. There are more people watching at the same time. You have only three minutes. This, uh, this, this room is booked a hundred times the, uh, the past two weeks. We all know these persuasion tricks. Um, and I say tricks, but there are no tricks. It's research. It's research and boss knows everything about this because Boss is an expert in the field of persuasion and behavior design. Um, as the best-selling author of Online Influence, he founded the Online Influence Institute. Um, with his online lead generating keukenplaats.nl, he disrupted the kitchen industry and generated millions of turnover the past years. He is the only one in the world who can call himself a Chialdini Method Certified Trainer and a BJ Fox Certified Tiny Habits Coach. He coached and trained thousands of professionals worldwide to increase their offline and online success. His mission is to help people and companies to a better level of performance by teaching them to apply the principles of persuasion and behavior design. And my big question of the day, Will it work differently in B2B? Let's find out. Boss, good morning. Great good morning, that you joined. Matt. Thanks for this lovely introduction. Yes, yes. That answer that question we will give an answer to. In one hour, all participants will find out that burning question. Yes. Uh, to start with, I like to share my screen. Um, he asked if you want to stop sharing. Ty. Yeah, of course. Ready? Share. And... I will check if we. Yeah, I can see your presentation, so we're good to go. Yes. So All right. we have about one hour. Um, so this will be a power college on online influence to boost your results on with proven behavioral science so first i have a question for the audience and if they can write the answers in the chat that would be great so my question is how important is persuasion or how important is online persuasion for you let's um, make it a great that's easy so if uh, five is very important one is you don't care so in, on a scale from one to five so i see chats coming in Thijs. what you see yes a lot of fives some fours uh 
uh, very few threes, but nothing lower than a three. I see two threes and the rest is all fours and fives. Even owner is saying a six. So very, very <laughs> important. So um, yeah, yeah, we all find it very important. That's the main conclusion here, Bas. Great, yeah. So there's a mutual agreement that being persuasive is really important. I often make the claim that if you are really persuasive, you are more successful in business, but perhaps also have more pleasure in your private life. Because if people do what you like them to do, for example, if your children listen, that mostly give most people some pleasure. <laughs> so, but this is a common understanding. So it's highly important. So my next question is, whoever from the participants done a fully academic study on what science has to say about the topic of persuasion. And that means a no or a yes. <laughs> yes, in the chat pane again, a no or a yes, a kind of yes of Rose. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, some yeses. Behavioral science is a study which mentioned yeah, by great. Frank. Um, so I think it's 50-50 here. A couple no's, hey, a, a really couple yeses. Interesting group. I'm really happy. Often what you see happening, of course, is that people understand it's super important to be persuasive, but they don't have a firm understanding on what science has to say about this topic. And there's over almost a hundred years of scientific research, how we make choices and how you can move people in your direction. So let's dive into this. But before we do, I like to set a few of basic foundations that people need to understand talking about online influence. And the first I like to address with this story. This is a research in California where people in a certain area were asked which of these messages would motivate you to start saving energy. So the first option was conserving energy helps the environment. The second one is helps future generations. So it's good for my children and grandchildren. The third one, it saves money. So it's good for my pocket. And the fourth one, your neighbors are already conserving energy. So people will ask, what would, what would you think motivate you to start saving energy? Just for fun in the chat, what, what you think most people gave as an answer? One, two, three, or four. Let me check. There are fours and threes. Okay, interesting. As, as the main chosen answers, and I think it's about 50-50. Okay, cool. And I understand there are a lot, there are more people here than average who have some knowledge about behavioral science and perhaps the Cialdini principles, which we'll address later. But four is, of course, a message based on social proof for people who are already familiar with it. But what people really gave as an answer was this. So most people said, I would be motivated to start saving energy because it helps the environment. And think about it. Hotels are very famous for their message to reuse their towels. And they try to motivate you with the same message because it's good for the environment. It's based on research. People actually say that this will motivate them. But what happens in this study? In the same area, another group of people were really asked to start saving energy and they were trying to be persuaded with these messages. And indeed, the message of neighbors are already doing it gave by far the best result. So one of the foundations I like people to understand is people typically don't know what influence their behaviors and decisions. So to understand to be a rock star in online influence, Often we go to our customers and to other people for advisors, and then we ask, what will motivate you to do this? That's not the right question to ask because people don't know it often, what motivates them in the moment of making a decision. So the second foundation, and this is a 
story of a sociologist name was Lapierre and Lapierre was somebody from France and he had in the 1930s two friends from China and he wants to visit America but in the 1930s the Chinese people in America were seen only good for labor unfortunately it was very racist period at that time and the Chinese people were only good for labor and often not allowed to go in hotels, bars, or restaurants. So what Lapierre did, he starts to visit 66 hotels, 104, 184 restaurants and cafes. So just in the chat, think about it. The main value of the people in America is I refuse Chinese people. How many times they visited 251 places? How many times they were rejected, you think? What you see, some answers, guys. I don't see a lot of chats coming in. Yeah, there are people thinking it's mainly over 200. So 200, yeah. 230. So think, based, based on these values, indeed, they are refused. Oh. One people say, one person says zero. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. It was one time. <laughs> oh, it so was so one time. <laughs> rejected. And then what Lapierre did, and this is the most interesting part, they did this travel to America in the 30s, and then he started writing to all these hotels and restaurants and cafes when he already was there. But he said to these restaurants and hotels, he said, I want to come with my Chinese friends to your place. Would you accept my Chinese friends as a guest? From the 251 places they already visited, 128 replied, and 92% said, no, you're not allowed. But one month earlier, he was already with Chinese people in these places. So the second foundation that I want to address is, we not always act in line with our values. And in this case, this is quite hopeful, actually. <laughs> But it's also good to know people can have a really strong opinion, but in a moment of decision making, they do other things. Then the third foundation I want to address is a story in Houston Airport. And this is pretty recent. What happened in Houston Airport? You had domestic flights, and they entered the air, uh, and there were a lot of complaints about the luggage. It took too long for people, they had to wait too long for their luggage to claim it. So they come in complaints, complaints, complaints. And at one point, the, direct, the board of Houston Airport says, we have to address this topic. So they hired really expensive experts. They shoved a lot around with the process. And finally, they had a great solution. They brought down the luggage time from the plane landing to the luggage belt back to eight minutes. That's Houston airport. I don't know if anybody's been there, but it's a huge airport. Um, but JF, within eight minutes, that's super fast, quicker than JFK in New York or anyone. So they were super happy. Okay, now we've done a great job. Nobody will complain anymore. But what happened? The complaints keep on coming in. So they didn't understand. We are one of the fastest airplanes to get it from the plane to the luggage belt. And then somebody with knowledge of behavior design came to have a look at it. What happened? The plane landed. And when people get out of the plane, there was a one minute walk and a seven minute wait at the luggage belt. And probably some people feel already the solution coming and how simple it was. The solution was park the plane further away. So what happened? The plane was parked further away. Now it was seven minutes walk and one minute waiting at the luggage belt and there were no more complaints ever. So the claim is people don't know what they want until they have it. Like this man, Henry Ford once said, if I would create it what people wanted, I have to breed it a faster horse instead of a car. So these three foundations are important to start working with behavioral science, because if you understand this, so people don't know what they want, people not always act in line with their values, and people don't know what influence their behavior, then we need another structure. 
and today I'm going to provide you this structure. And to begin with, I'd like to address three important uh, scientists. On this, on this picture, we see two people. In the world of behavioral science, both are famous. In general, one is really famous. So the one that is famous is, of course, in general, is Barack Obama. Does anybody know who is the other guy? Please write in the chat if you know, or if you don't know, you can write, I don't know. Kahneman, somebody said. Yes, perfect answer. Who, who, who wrote Rose, Rose. Rose, great job, great job. Yes, it's in fact Daniel Kahneman. Fun part is both, guy, both people on this slide have a connection with Dr. Cialdini, which I will address after. But Kahneman, he gets the Medal of Freedom Award on this picture from Barack Obama. He was then the current president. And the Medal of Freedom Award is the highest award you can get as a citizen in the United States. And Kahneman has a lot of scientific research on behavioral science, but he won a Nobel Prize in 2002. And how you win a Nobel Prize? You have to do groundbreaking research and you have to present this groundbreaking research not just on a piece of paper but it has to be a decent report report and he is a behavioral scientist so you would expect he gets the nobel prize for psychology but he got the nobel prize for economics and his research changed actually the foundation of university education in economics. So what did he prove that was so groundbreaking? He had a, his foundation of his research is we have two systems, system one and system two. And there was already a lot of more research. So this is not why he got this Nobel prize. I will address this later, but this is very important to understand. So system one is our fast unconscious brain, which is very necessary to make daily decisions. For example, if you step in some venue and you have to pick a chair, it would be impossible if we would take the air conditioning flow and see what's the best angle on the screen or all kinds of stuff, we would not function. So we need system one to make fast decisions. System two is our slow conscious brain and that costs us effort. So this is, we need this for complex decisions. The difference between system one and system two, a system one is based on what is in psychology, heuristics and biases. So pre-assumptions in our brain to make choices, but this could be error prone. So sometimes it not makes the right decision. System two is reliable and old economics always says, we are very rational creatures. And if we make choices, we know what we choose. And there comes the groundbreaking research. In 2002, Kahneman showed us that 90% of all our choices are done by system one, our unconscious brain. And these were not only choices, where do I sit in a room? These were also choices which house I buy. So this is one of the biggest spending we ever do in our lifetime. To give you this example, we start really rational. So often you go to a website in Holland, it's called Funda, and you start really rational. I want to live in that area, this many bedrooms, I want to have a garden or a balcony, all these rational aspects. And then we go to view houses. And then you come to the cliche, Oh, I, it was a little bit too expensive, but I had to buy it because I fell totally in love with this house. That's not really rational talking. That's system one. So it's in the moment of decision making, most choices we made with system one. In 2002, this was 90%. Today, there's done more research and it's already upgrading to 95%. And that's because we have so many more and more choices to make and we get more and more distracted by all kinds of apps and other technology that we current that we all the time are asking for our attention so this is a quote from kahneman system one runs the show that's the one you want to move and if you want to use behavioral science it's the basic foundation how you should think because often when we want to persuade other people, we want to come with really rational arguments. 
And that's a mistake. Rational arguments are triggering system two. We want to trigger system one. And I'm going to explain you how you can change, how you can trigger system one. And when Kahneman was asked how you can trigger system one, he answered, okay, I won this Nobel Prize for this research and be proven that we make these choices with system one. But if you want to trigger system one, I would say Dr. Cialdini is the most practical psychologist on earth. So I'll introduce Cialdini in a minute. I want to address a comparison for system one. In our book, we compare it to a child of seven. A lot of people compare it to the croc brain. And we compare it for, to a child of seven for two reasons. One, system one is smarter than a crocodile because system one can read basic sentences, can do some mathematician. So it's smarter than a crocodile. But the most important is, if I tell you, imagine to talk to a crocodile, it will be quite hard probably. But if I say, imagine talking to a child of seven, you can start to have some new ideas. So think in an online environment, you're always talking to a child of seven. Then Cialdini, uh, perhaps a lot of people know him. He was a professor at uh, the university in Arizona and the end 70s. So he starts to do research and his, he was fascinated by why do I do things that I don't necessarily want to do? For example, I'm sitting on my couch, watching TV, I have a good show on the TV and suddenly the doorbell rings. Okay, I open the door, I make a talk, I go sit back on my couch and suddenly I have a new energy provider. Why? I didn't ask for somebody to change my energy provider. I didn't need it because all electricity functioned perfectly fine, but I still did it. Why do I do such things? So he looked back at the scientific research that was already in place at beginning 80s. Actually, the first research of influence came to light when Hitler came to power. Scientists were intrigued by how can a man who who advocacy such a totalitarian regime, how can he get so many followers? How does he do this? And then the first influence research came to light. And actually during World War II, of course, there was a lot of influence research became, because it really became a matter of life and death if you could influence somebody. So Cialtini looked at 50 years of data and he thought the data is not a real world. These are experiments. I need to go out there. And then he goes undercover for three years and he calls himself all kinds of names like Bob Colden and he starts working as a car salesman in a PR agency. He even was in army recruitment. He even um, went into cults and he saw how influence worked in practice. And then he wrote a book, Influence. And with his book, he became really famous because it's a New York Times bestseller, sold more than five and a half million copies and it translated in 43 different languages. So what is in this book? In the book Influence, he describes six universal principles of influence. And these are reciprocity, liking, social proof, authority, consistency, and scarcity. Just address them with a quick example. So reciprocity is if I, I invite you to my birthday party, you feel some pressure to invite me back on your party. Liking if somebody, a stranger is moving houses here on the street and asking me, boss, please help me. And I don't know this person, I probably say no. But if my best friend asks me to help him, I probably say yes. Social proof ties in the introduction he named booking.com but it's a shortcut. Oh, if thousand people say this is a good hotel, probably it is and I book it. And probably some of you people thinking now, ah, booking.com, yeah, but we hate this or I don't believe this at booking, they are famous for it. But I know for a fact, because my co-author is in booking.com at the moment, they did a test and removed all social proof and it was back within 10 minutes because they saw a drop of about 35% in bookings once they removed this. So that's the difference between system two and system one thinking. 
Then you have authority. If I'm sick, I not call a plumber, but a doctor, because I think my doctor studied for it. And I always say, whoever asked the diplomas of their doctor? Nobody probably, but so it's a, it's a shortcut. And that's really important in influencing people. Then consistency in Holland, we have a saying who says A need to see, say B. So we feel an internal pressure to act consistent with what we previously said or done. And scarcity, Black Friday is coming up and we know how people respond to this. It's not quite rational. So that's the work for Cialdini. And then I need one more scientist and that's this man, BJ Fogg. And BJ Fogg is the founder of the Fogg behavioral model and the founder of the term behavior design. And behavior design means you can design an environment in a way that you see more times the desired behavior that you want to see. And BJ Fogg was uh, the professor from Tristan Harris, and Tristan Harris is in, uh, for example, the, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, and he's the founder of Instagram. But Tristan Harris, before Instagram, he built another app and it was not successful. And then he worked with BJ Fogg, with his BJ Fogg behavioral model to make this more successful. And we know the end of the story. Within one year, they sold Instagram for a billion dollars to Facebook. So it was quite a success story. So what is this Fogg behavioral model? There are three factors if you want to create behavior. And often we think if people don't do what we like them to do, they are not motivated enough. But Fox showed us there are two other important factors. So you see here the Fox behavioral model. And I can be highly motivated to do something. Say, for example, I want to buy tickets for my favorite band. But the website is blocking all the time because everybody's going to this website. So it's hard to do, but you see the action line. Probably I still do it. But behavior can also be easy to do and I can be low motivated. When I go to university previously, I go with a train and there was always on the train station other people giving me a newspaper called the Metro. I didn't want to have this Metro newspaper, but every morning it was so it was more easy to take the newspaper than to refuse the newspaper. So every morning I had the newspaper in my hand. So you see, if behavior is easy to do and I'm not so motivated, I probably will do it as well. And we need a prompt. And a prompt is the thing that asks for the behavior. I will explain all these three factors in a minute and then I will address with examples how you can use them for your benefit in an online environment. You have to realize there are three important factors to create behavior. So let's show, this is a quite famous example. A lot of people taking the escalators. We want, to be, want people to be healthy, so we want people to take the stairs. What kind of design can we apply people to take the stairs? and they created a piano. And when you walked on it, it made some music and you saw more and more people taking the stairs. Another recent example is this one. In Indonesia, they dress up actors as ghosts to prevent people to go outside to spread the coronavirus. So now we're going into the online world. In our book, we describe 37 principles how you can boost motivation, how you can increase ability, and how you can design winning prompts. Are there any questions so far, Thijs? Uh, yeah, no, now with theory and we dive into practice, and that's for most people often the fun part. Yeah, no, we're good to go. There are no further questions for this uh, stage, and we're halfway time. Yes, great. So, First the case, this is the case we did for B Post. That's the Belgian post office. And um, I really like this case because you see all three factors of the Fogg model come together in this case. This was the old landing page for their product, removing your post to your new address. It's 
in Dutch, so uh, for the I see a lot of Dutch names, but for English speaking, I will still address it. Um, so same as in Holland, we have a service. I already moved to my new house, but I still get mail on my old house and the postal service automatically forwarded to my new address. You need to pay a little bit for it. And this they want to sell and you come to this landing page called moving service. But right away, you see here, not one, but five prompts. I can do five things. So five things are getting my attention. And then I can do move my post, do the moving service. So actually this is quite confusing and confusion decreases the ability. Then I have here one, search a solution. That's an interesting one. We, for probably for them, it was really clear what they meant with it. But for a first time visitor of a site, probably would think, what kind of solution? So this became the new landing page with an elevator page, three reasons why, some social proof behind the image and one prompt, one button. Not a costly redesign, but a highly effective redesign because these were the results. The clicks to the sales funnel increased with 64 point, more than 64%. Sales went up with 41%. The project we did was paid back in 20 days and in a half year, the return on investment was almost 820%. Why we could make these numbers? Because we come from a structure. We think in the three factors that creates behavior. And the first factor is prompts. This is always the difficult. When I start, started studying this material, prompts was the most difficult to understand 100% correctly for me. But let me explain. Prompts are words, objects, sounds, and thoughts that we perceive and ask us to show a certain behavior or remind us to show a certain behavior. So your alarm clock, that's a prompt to wake up. These notifications are prompts to open these apps. The advertisement here below the shoe, this button is a prompt to click on it. The headline of this news article is also a prompt to click on it. The blue circles here in my email box are prompts to open my email. So we are prompted with a lot of things during the day and actually in the same moment. So in an online environment, we have to design the winning prompt. Imagine a lot of clients probably are surfing on their mobile. So you have the prompts that they get from the web, but also the prompts from WhatsApp, Facebook, all applications that are on the phone, and they even could be called. We sometimes forget it, but that's also a prompt to pick up your phone. So we need to create a winning prompt and a winning prompt needs stopping power. Stopping power to stop doing what you are doing and start to do what we like you to start doing. And a fun one, one principle that we describe is the curiosity strategy for prompts. And this is what Volkswagen did with curiosity in Sweden. I don't know if anybody speaks Swedish in this group. I don't, but I know for a fact, it says the world's deepest trash can. So it made people curious. How on earth is this the world's deepest trash can? And when you throw some trash inside, you had a noise they build in. So it looked like it made, looked like it was, it sounded like it was really deep. So what happened, this deepest trash can in the world was used eight times more often than a normal trash can and there was literally less waste on the street. That was of course the goal. How can you apply this in online environments? For example, in your advertisement. This is a case my co-author Joris did for the France lottery. The left was the first one that was their control and then they made people curious. Is your mobile number worth 100,000 euros? With this advertisement and the same sales funnel behind it, they got more clicks, but they got also four times more sales because people were loaded and started into their sales funnel more times. 
then this is an important a lot of people these days are blogging uh, and then the headline is your prompt to click on it or your advertisement in google is your prompt to click on it we pay a lot of money often to google adwords but we not necessarily think what do i write exactly in my advertisement to get all these clicks newspapers are of course they think about it really well what is the title so for example how you can use curiosity in headlines the way of working changing drastically this one we changed to this is what work will look like in the future and the a b test showed 180 percent more clicks so i give you a few advices how you can use curiosity the first one is use a how title and again you don't need to write lists you get the recording and can look it back or a surprising statistic triggers curiosity a why title use the word this and a list we like lists so these five i want to give you the advice start testing it start using it and see that people move more often in your direction as a first step as a first prompt then another interesting fact what we often forget is competing prompts as a marketeer or as a salesperson, you can often think, oh, I have all these kind of products and I want to show them all to my clients because maybe they pick one of this. From a behavioral science perspective, this is not the right thing to do. In this cartoon, we compare it to this situation. Imagine you walk into a birthday party and there are already 50 people inside and all these 50 people start talking right away to you. Once you come to the door, probably you run away because you cannot follow one conversation. But that's actually what we do online. We are starting with all, start talking with all our products at the same page to this visitor. So then you've got a lot of competing prompts, we call it. And here we have a case with a lot of competing prompts from Sayat. And Sayat, you see, they have a lot of navigation options on top. Every button is a prompt because I can click on it. It, it asks me to click on it. Then below the navigation, beside the logo, I can click again on a lot of different car models. Then I have three more prompts that are lined out and I have a four prompt to find a location. So a lot of competing prompts. But actually what they wanted people to do is download the price list because they knew from a funnel perspective if there on the based on the number of downloads of price list we have these numbers of test drives and on based on the test drive we have these numbers of sales so there was created a redesign sorry this design had 0 0.4 conversion in general then this redesign with one single prompt to start downloading the price list clean simple one prompt strategy created eight percent conversion to go from 0 0.4 to eight percent you not have to uplift by 7.6 at this moment we do it two thousand percent better than the control group so think about if you after this webinar if you look at your landing pages can i remove some prompts and really focus let my visitors focus on the desired behavior that i want them to do still no questions about prompts guys no good to go good to go okay great yes thank you then i address the next important piece of the BJ fork model and that's ability and before i do that i want to give the advice the formula that BJ4 created is B is map or behavior is motivation, ability and prompt at the same time. If you start doing problem solving, we are general aiming for motivation. My advice to you and the advice from BJ4 is start at prompt. So if people don't do what you like them to do, think is there a prompt? If people look at this screen, is there something that asks for the desired behavior? 
If you can answer this with a yes, and you used all the correct strategies that you described in our book, and the answer is still yes, then go to ability. Because if you make behavior easier to do, it's always easier. Motivation, I will address in a minute, is a little bit harder. But people will also like your website more if it's easier. So you get more the desired outcome, but people will also give you a higher review because it's so easy to do. So it works in two ways, the ability aspect. So let me take at a case. And this is an interesting case of the Dutch government. And in, in Holland, we can have loans as a student. And most students uh, use this loan to go to the bar. That's actually in, in basic what happens with the money. I don't say all students, but they loan and they like to have a nice student life. But in Holland, we're thinking now, ah, then the students had four year, five year university and they have a debt of 50,000 euro. They need to pay it back somewhere. So it's a pretty big burden on their shoulders already before they start working. So the challenge was how can we choose people that take the maximum loan? And at that time, 86% of all students took the maximum loan. But what was the case? If you go to the website to apply for this loan as a student, then the default setting was take the maximum loan. So on the governmental side, there was, I'm a student, I go there, I want to apply for the loan, and the standard option was take the maximum. So the government wants to reduce it, and from a behavioral science perspective, it was quite an easy solution probably you guess it, the standard, the default setting became take the minimum loan. So now you would say, yeah, but if they want to have party money, it's not that easy to click maximum loan. I agree. From a system two perspective, you would might be thinking, hmm, does this have impact? From a system one perspective, I would say, yes, this will have impact. And indeed, it had a lot of impact. Because just, staying, just changing the default setting, it went down that only 11% of students took the maximum loan because it became just harder to do to get the maximum loan. So this is ability turn around. So actually we changed the desired behavior. We made it easier, loan a little bit less. And at the same time, we make undesired behavior harder to do because to take a maximum loan you should you it took more effort then another case from uh ability it's remove distraction again i said it with prompts but also there's a lot of distractive messages in in websites and this is a nice example it was from sin city and they wanted to sell their, ga sell their games. So they had the SimCity game and they had the SimCity Deluxe Edition. And their goal was just at this pace, buy the game. But they have a super interesting offer on top of it. Order the game now, you don't get any discount, but if you come back the next time and you order more games, you get 20 euro. That's absolutely not motivated enough to start ordering now. So it becomes actually more a distraction, this super extra offer. So when we, they removed this offer, sales went up with 43%. So my advice here is from an ability perspective, and we call this kill your darlings, because sometimes you need to remove some things that you are pretty proud of, but just by removing it, the ability increased because for everything we need to read or see, it costs us mental effort. And the more mental effort, the lower the ability. And because we don't get a lot of questions I see in the chat, I like to address on ability one more topic. We call this the Jenga technique. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Jenga game, but you have a, a wooden tower built on blocks and the game is built. You have to take out the blocks and the tower have to Stay standing. You can do this with words. Does somebody have an idea what it costs to 
read 100 words on average. Has somebody an idea in the chat? For the cost and time or? Cost and time, yes, sorry. Um, okay, so in the chat pane, how many seconds, minutes, uh, it will take you to read a text of 100 words? One minute, somebody is saying, Rose has no ID. I don't think either. 30 seconds, so 40 seconds. It's only 100 words, so it's, it's, it's really, that's not a lot. It's, it's like a little, uh, a little topic below a headline. 10 seconds. Yes, more like seconds. That. Yeah. It's so also between 10 and 40 seconds. seconds. Four seconds it costs us to read 100 words. But imagine how much content we writing on websites. So try, mo, what we claim is often you can reduce to let the tower stand, you can reduce 50% of the words. And we have several cases that by removing this content, say, keep on saying the same, but with lesser words, upgraded conversions between 20 to 50% already. So this I like to address as one extra technique, which we describe, extra principle that we describe in our book. Then I like to go into motivation. Or do you have some questions already, Thijs? Not yet? Uh, no. Great, then I dive into motivation. Why, if you do problem solving, why do motivation as the last part? Because there is motivational waves. I could be motivated for the same thing on a different moment in the same day, completely different. For example, when I wake up, I can look in the mirror and I think, well, boss, your belly could be a little bit more tidier than it is today. And I could be highly motivated to eat healthy and to start working out in the gym. In the afternoon, I could sit on the terrace in the sun and then I could just order a nice beer and a beef and a steak, for example. So the motivation for doing something is different in, a, in, the, in another moment at the same day. So motivation comes in waves and we are able to boost motivation just before making a decision. But this is the hardest part. It's easier for you to design winning prompts, increase ability, then it is boosting motivation in the exact same time in an online environment because it's we're talking from one to many. We're designing something, not one-on-one, -on -one, that's in sales conversations, but online we have one design with a lot of visitors. And we, you, so you cannot make it completely personal. Of course, there are softwares that are more and more able to do it, so that's great. But my advice is problem solving, prompt ability, and then motivation. But if you become really good in motivation, you'll be, because it's the most difficult, you'll become truly something different. So let's take a look at motivation. We come back to the Cialdini principles. So here I have an example of scarcity and social proof. This was a discount offer from a software company. And they say, Okay, normally our software is 379 euro or dollars, and you can buy it now for $29. Okay, we like discount as, per, as human beings, but so they sold this special offer. But when they added two principles, scarcity and social proof, they boosted conversion. So what they added, scarcity, there was a minimum amount of time left to get this deal. Then next to it, you see bundles bought. Oh, 432 people, social proof, already bought this thing, already bought this deal. And then again, they highlighted scarcity, status almost ended. So by applying these three simple things, sales went up with almost 300%. Same deal, just highlighting two principles. And the interesting thing on this case, what I like to address, is you can use these motivational principles together. They make each other stronger if you use them in the correct way. And then I have my last, oh, 
Ah, these slides are not in the correct order. No worries. Then I have my last case. It's a case from my previous company, which I sold, and we called it Keukenplaats, and that means a place for kitchens. Um, probably same as you, you're working to get good reviews. We did the same. And we had over 10,000 reviews from highly satisfied clients. And we, we had them on our website and we had them behind the button beoordelingen, it's reviews in Dutch. So we had the assumption years ago, okay, people who want to see these reviews will click on it. There was a wrong decision. If you have social proof, you not only have to collect it to get it, but you also have to bring it to your visitors because social proof is according to Cialdini himself, the most powerful principle in an online world. And I agree completely with him. What we did was this. We put the reviews on our homepage and we put the reviews above every call to action. So our call to action was in the orange button. We want people to ask for a, for a meeting, for a visit in our showroom. Why we moved it above? Because in the Western world, we, lead, we read from top to bottom, left to right. And how quick we do it, unconsciously, we still do this. So I want to, before people see my request, I want to load them that we had a lot of great reviews. So we are a quality kitchen place. The results, uh, and that was a wrong slide, Conversion. This so we, conversion went up with 34.3% because our sales funnel lead to appointment. Appointment to sales stayed almost the same. Extra turnover, 3.1 million euros. And then the interesting question, what did this cost us? Almost nothing. We already had these reviews. We had to just, just design some few stars and enter them on the website, maybe a few hundred euro. What a high impact. This is what we call small bigs. Small changes, big outcomes. So, does, do you have any questions? Of course, you can always contact me later on uh, with our website onlineinfluence.com or my LinkedIn. Bas Wouters are a lot of them. That's not a quite unique Dutch name. So that's why CMCT stands for Cialdini Method Certified Trainer. And th then it becomes <laughs> unique in LinkedIn. So I mean, okay. it's fine. Thijs, do you have some questions for me? Yeah, let's give everybody a couple seconds to uh, to answer their uh, or to to ask their questions again in the in the chat pane if you want. Um, you presenting here your your books. Um, you had a great launch of the English one a couple of weeks ago, right? Yes, that was uh, really cool. We did a webinar with uh, Dr. Cialdini. We had over ten thousand registered participants. So uh, they came from all over the world, America, India, Russia, Brazil. So uh, cool. that was good to see. We, got, uh, we could move some traction uh, there. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So it's a, quite a hot topic at this, uh, at this stage. Um, yeah, we get some reactions in the chat pane here that everybody uh, uh, are, are thanking you, Bas, for your story. They find it interesting and inspiring. So that's good to hear. There are no uh, uh, questions uh, for now. Um, I would like to thank you as well, Bas. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I've, I'm, I've read the Dutch version of your book and I really like all the examples in there. So please, I want to uh, um, address that to everybody. Please take your English copy or your uh, Dutch copy um, because it's a really interesting uh, uh, book in order to have some practical ideas on how to optimize your own website and your own influential uh, influencer uh, behavior online um how many people are reading this at the at this moment how, how many copies did, did you sold uh, do you have some tricks there <laughs> to give it some authority <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, actually the book is some Holland. social proof <laughs> i have some authority for uh, for the audience we are nominated for best marketing book from holland 2020 and within uh, next week on thursday we will have the 
the results. So ah, uh, nice. All right. A lot of books. Yeah. So I'm curious. That will be so, great. Okay. So you might go to win a, going to win an award by the end of next week. That's amazing. Yeah, we'll All right, guys. Um, boss, again, thank you so much. Uh, talk to each other soon. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we will invite you for upcoming episodes uh, uh, via email and hope to see you there anytime soon. Thank, thank you, guys, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.